The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Is it mad that the world burning is not in our, like, top three concerns? You thought bad news was done, but I'm back with more. In Alice Sneddon's Bad News Saves the World, I finally address the climate crisis and explore why no one cares. Watch it on thespinoff.co.nz. I can see the anxiety (laughs) starting to emit from you. When the Facts Change is brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Kiwi Bank. The bank for Kiwi looking to get ahead in business and in life. A bank that delivers expertise and banking know-how, smart advice for business owners wanting to invest, grow their business or diversify. A bank that adapts with technology through the lens of its people and customers. It is a bank with heart that is driven by its purpose. Kiwi making Kiwi better off. Have you ever heard that phrase, penny wise and pound foolish? Now, we don't tend to use pennies and pounds these days, but it captures the essence of a particular problem that some organisations, governments, people have, where they save money now and think they're being very clever, but actually it costs them a lot more money in the long run. Let's say, for example, you've got a house, it's leaking, and you know basically you're going to have to fix the whole roof. You're going to have to take it off, you're going to have to put it back on with brand new iron, and sure, it's going to cost a lot of money, but in the long run, you're better off if you just replace the whole roof and do a proper job with the maintenance. Or you can buy one of those tubes of sticky goo that you get from I to 10 Mega or... Bunnings Warehouse, where you squirt the goo in the hole and hope that it lasts just long enough until you can sell the house and hope that nobody notices after you've sold the house. That's penny wise and pound foolish. And sometimes it works. It really needs you to be able to flick the asset on before anyone works out that you've underinvested in the maintenance. And sometimes that's that makes sense. And sometimes Maybe the roof will last a lot longer than you think and you can sweat that asset for even longer. And maybe, you know, a few spots of rain on the floor don't matter that much. Perhaps, you know, it helps give a bit of extra humidity to the house. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe all of that extra rain coming into the house causes mould, causes people to get sick. And maybe the Water gets into the rafters of the house and starts to rot away. Before you know it, you not only have to replace the roof, but you have to replace the rafters. And you have to take whoever's gotten sick with the black mould, with the chest infections and the skin infections, off to the hospital. And it costs someone money for them to stay in two or three nights. And then you have to get some antibiotics and... You have to take a few days off work and then you realise actually deciding not to replace the roof seemed like a good idea at the time but it's cost me a lot more money in the long run and it's cost other people as well who actually had no say in that decision. Essentially, that's the story of Aotearoa over the last 30 years in a nutshell. We've been penny wise and pound foolish with our entire country. And we've done it because, well, it's always good to be elected, isn't it? And it's always good to not have to pay right now. Maybe you can grant yourself a tax cut. Maybe you don't have to put money aside over the next few years to repair the roof or repair the road or maybe build a better roof, one that's going to last even longer. Because ultimately someone else will pay the price. And if you're a politician and you realise that the sound bites are five or six seconds and the public's view on things lasts for about 50 or 60 seconds and that this scandal, this hole in the roof, no one will remember it in a few years' time. And anyway, you're probably not going to be the minister or the prime minister in five or six years when the roof really loses it. That's for someone else to deal with. And that's where we've been over the last 30 years. We haven't invested in our infrastructure. 
we don't have enough housing, our taxes are too low for the levels of infrastructure and population growth that we need, we've allowed underinvestment in our health system to gnaw away at the fabric of it so that it loses its ability to deal with shocks, it's not resilient enough, and when it's put under pressure, it actually collapses. And we're pretty close to that with our health system at the moment. We're certainly there with our housing system. We have 24,000 people on a waiting list for housing. We all know of people living in cars, living in doorways, unable to find places to live. And we know that there are 480,000 people who don't have enough food, largely because they're having to pay rents which are too high. That's because New Zealand has the most expensive rents in the world relative to income and the most stressed renters in the world, in that we have the largest share of people who are having to spend more than 40% of their income on rent. All of these issues we have built up over the last 30 years are now coming home to roost. What was penny wise in 2011 is now pound foolish in 2023. This week on When the Facts Change, we're going to talk about well-being and we're going to talk a lot about the real costs of things in the long run and how you make decisions as a society, as a government, as voters, about trying not to be penny wise and pound foolish and how you can use this idea of well-being to try to reframe these decisions, which are often based around purely financial thoughts. How much is it going to cost me to repair the roof? Surely that tube of goo is much cheaper right now. And if I don't have to spend money on the roof, maybe I can go on, for, go on a holiday next year. But if I'm forced, maybe through a new set of rules or a set of practices that the government departments have to live by, or maybe it's a change in legislation, which means you're forced to think about the long-term impacts the impacts that are wider than just something you can measure in dollars and cents, but actually includes things like the costs for future generations, the damage done to the environment, the damage done to people's mental health, the stress people feel, which eventually bubbles up and ends up as mental health problems in years to come. This week on When the Facts Change, I speak to a wellbeing expert, Catherine Trebek, who um, heads up the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, is working with governments and many others to try to embed these ideas about thinking about wellbeing when you're making decisions. We have a good discussion about how this is being done here and around the world and why it's a good idea to do it. And we try to unravel how you would make these decisions differently how you would come up with the right decision to actually replace the roof rather than buy the tube of goo, and how it's playing out throughout societies, how being penny wise and pound foolish is costing us dearly. I was reminded of this just a few days after this interview when we heard the tragic news of the fire at the Loafers Lodge in Wellington story resonated perhaps a bit deeper for me than it might have at another time or if I'd come from somewhere else. But I'm from Wellington and I used to go to the supermarket regularly right across from the Loafers Lodge. I wondered a lot about who lived in there, how long, what it was like, but never actually made the effort to go and have a closer look. The fire which ripped through Loafers Lodge early in the morning a couple of weeks ago cost six people their lives and we now know that the top floor of the Loafers Lodge, which had been converted from an office block built in the 70s without sprinklers, converted into single bedrooms, no kitchens, no bathrooms, had effectively been a fire trap. The police, it turns out, had recommended to the council that they not give it a building approval because of the fire risks of the way that the building was converted, in particular the top floor, which had not nearly enough exits. We've learned from interviews with the people at Loafers Lodge how 
because there were no kitchens and bathrooms. People were smoking in their rooms. People were cooking toast in their rooms. And as we've discovered, one of the residents was a convicted arsonist. We learned that the true costs of 30 years of underinvestment in our infrastructure, our housing, our health system, our education system, essentially in our people, about half a million people now who can't afford enough to buy their own food and to have a house that they can pay for from their own revenues, that they need some sort of subsidy to the tune of $4 billion worth of housing subsidies at the moment. That demand for food banks has tripled over the last three years. And we have to ask ourselves, uh, what do we do now to turn around this penny wise and pound foolish approach and instead focus on the longer run? It is possible if you're a financial type in Treasury to actually quantify the costs over the long run that are wider than just the cost of building something right now. You can, for example, look at the liabilities built up in your health system from not investing properly in your housing system. You can work out what are the lost opportunity costs of not investing in your people. You can start to understand what pound foolish actually means. How many pounds foolish are you? We're starting to get a sense of it. The work's been done in the last couple of years to find out that we have an infrastructure deficit of $100 billion and that we need to invest at least another $100 billion to keep up with population growth of 0.5% per year. Currently, it's running at 2% per year, and we have to invest heavily. Interestingly, our current government has said that we can't afford that. What they're actually saying is that we've decided we want low taxes, low investment, low wages, low productivity, poor well-being, more than we want to invest, to have higher taxes, to invest more, to consume less now in the long run. And until we start to unpack the true costs of our underinvestment, it's going to be hard to put these things into a bright light and make decisions about them as politicians, as voters, and ultimately as citizens of a country that has been corroded and eroded and underinvested and weakened for 30 years and which has built enormous as yet undiscovered liabilities under the surface in the future. That's this week on When the Facts Change. Catherine, welcome into When the Facts Change. Lovely to uh, have you on the show. Tell us about what's brought you to the wellbeing um, area and why we should care. Sure. Well, hi, Bernard. Great to meet you and really lovely to be having this conversation with you. So to, to me, it's a long story of how I've started focusing on, on the, the idea of a wellbeing economy, essentially an economy that's very deliberately designed to serve what people and planet need and to deliver collective wellbeing. I spent a long time working in Oxfam and I was living in Glasgow at the time and there's huge health inequalities there. Uh, there's a part of Glasgow just to the east of the city that I could jog to, so not very far at all from where I lived, where life expectancy can be as low as 54 for men. And when I moved there and realising those sorts of statistics, it was a bit of a wake-up call that here I was living in what the sixth richest country in the world by GDP terms. And yet the way things were operating uh, and there were very clear winners and losers out of that economic system was literally a matter of life and death. And so I started questioning what sort of economy do we have? And I started seeing how a lot of the issues that colleagues were working on, whether that was anti-poverty or environmental issues or health issues, if you took the time to pause and look beyond just the symptoms, if you took the time to do what I often say is channel your inner three-year-old and ask, but why, but why, but why, then you start facing the economy. Uh, and so I was asked some big hard questions about the nature of the economic system. Does it need to be this way? And how could we redesign it? And from that, uh, took me into the conversation about the wellbeing economy and issues of progress and measures, but also different business models and really what's the economy about and perhaps most importantly, who is it for? Yeah, that question of, you know, what are we 
targeting what what do we see as success is the crucial one. And until now, from most of the last hundred years or so, it's been well, it's GDP, yeah. or maybe it's employment, or maybe it's wages and unemployment and inflation. But essentially, these are very measurable things, often focused on financial measures. You know, what is the value of the output? What is the value of the hour worked? Uh, and ignores all of those people who don't do paid work. It ignores, of course, the real costs, but their unpriced costs on environment, um, people's experience of life. You know, they might not be happy. <laughs> yeah, uh, or that so many, so many of the best experiences don't have a price tag to, to them. Yeah. So I, I've just got out of the taxi here and looked across this beautiful field with the autumn leaves, and I thought, you know what? Gee, I'd love to just walk around that field and soak up um, the wind and the rain and get, you know, sit under a tree for a bit. And that would have been great for my well-being. Wouldn't have cost anything. Yeah, so how do we incorporate all of these non-financial measures into the way that we organise ourselves and value things and make decisions about who gets resources and who doesn't? If I can answer your question in a, from a bit of a different direction uh, for, for a moment, is that so many of these things that are really important to people's quality of life, and I, I like to think of well-being as essentially about quality of life in, in all its dimensions, they have a very real material basis. So the economy really impacts. Do people have time to, say, walk around a field and sit under a tree? Because if they're having to work two or three jobs on low wages, they won't have time to do that. If they're worried about their houses being flooded, as we've seen so frequently here, here in Auckland, they, they were going to feel very, very stressed. But those floods are exacerbated by climate change, which is exacerbated by the production and consumption systems that have been built up over decades. So there's the economic root of that stress, that climate anxiety. But if you looked well. at it in a purely economic sense, a flood is a great thing. You just had a lot of extra spending yes. on, on fixing the windows and... And, and the cleaning. emergency services over time yeah. and the insurance premiums and, and so on. And, and that is a really good example, Bernard, of, of what folks are starting to call failure demand or avoidable costs. And this is this idea that more spending on something, more demand for a resource, particularly here, you know, government services, is not necessarily a sign of success. Often, and, and tell you what, when you start looking at government announcements you see, in, through this lens, you'll see it all the time, that often what governments are celebrating is, look how much we're spending on the police, look how much we're spending on more and more hospitals. Maybe that's because we're feeling less safe and we feel, we're unhealthy. And so maybe that spending is downstream, responsive, remedial repair work where actually, and this is very at the very heart of what the wellbeing economy agenda is about, is surely we can do better than that. Surely we can do better than just putting sticking plasters and band-aids on the collateral damage. And I don't want to denigrate that downstream support because it's absolutely important helping people and planet survive and cope today and tomorrow. So it's not, it's not disparaging of that, but it's to say we have to do more than just going symptom by symptom, crisis by crisis. We have to take the time to understand what are the patterns that connect them and then look upstream and think about, okay, what, what are the root causes of some of these challenges? What, why are we seeing more and more people sleeping rough in our streets and sleeping in doorways in our capital cities? Why are young people scared for their future and coming out of their classrooms to, to strike? Why are we seeing this epidemic of loneliness that was being discussed on the, on the news today? So the idea of the wellbeing economy is essentially daring to ask why and being bold enough to take action up there. At root causes. So how do you flip the um, equations and allow decision makers, analysts, politicians, voters to look at things in a different way? Because at the moment we, we look at things and go, well, there's a set amount of money that a government has and it has to do it, the things that it desperately needs to do right now. And, you know, when there are people who are sick, we have to look after them or uh, people who've just committed a crime, we have to put them in prison. And we tend not to think about these decisions in longer terms or turn what are effectively operational spending decisions into longer term uh, capital investment decisions, thinking about it from a purely financial mm -hmm. point of view. How do you change the equations away from short term ambulance at the bottom of the cliff to, well, let's let's have a jolly good fence and, and some signs and avoid the mm. cliff jumping. Or maybe 
maybe we could even stop people thinking they wanted to work towards that cliff face in the first place. I mean, that that is the real real prize. So there's lots in your question there. I mean, and what you've described is is we do have a lot of government systems. Uh, I mean, across the world, this certainly isn't a unique challenge for New Zealand. They that are targeted towards downstream spending, working on issues in isolation, uh, lurching from one crisis to the next, not seeing the connected root causes, but also then missing out on the potential co or multiple benefits from responding creatively. So, for for example, so many of the issues in that the health department will be working on. The root causes of those are, are not the preserve of the health department. They're about the education department, the employment department, the, the environmental department. And so how can governments start to reach across those aisles and across those buildings and team up and think, actually, if, we, if we're a bit creative here, we can be more ambitious for the, for the benefits. So there's a lot of talk around co or multiple benefits, uh, particularly in the health community. But, I mean, a, a simple example. So folks are paying high prices for their energy to heat their homes. So could we have, say, a more energy-efficient building stock in, across New Zealand? Could we do a lot of energy in, insulation and retrofitting? First, That's first priority. But then we could say, okay, well, who's getting those jobs? Are they people perhaps who are further from the labour market? Are they more recent arrivals to New Zealand? Uh, what's the gender balance of, of those jobs? And how can we also do so in a way that they're not just plugging in uh, plastic, but perhaps they're making the homes more uh, light on the environment in other perspectives as well? So it's being a bit bolder and saying, let's just pause and think, could we, could we get a few more outcomes here? In terms of the change process, I often think there's almost three things that we need to work on, you know, those of us who, who are change agents and most I suspect most people in the different ways are. But I, I think what's important is things like pioneers, policies and perspectives. And so perspectives is essentially daring to ask, you know, can the economy be in service of people and planet rather than as we often see the other, the other way around? Uh, can we realign the goal of government? Uh, and the goal of the economy to deliver what people and planet need. And that, that then means we're running a very, very different ruler over policy analysis, policy evaluation and timeframes. And incidentally, as you've mentioned, the capital budget, folks spending the capital budget are pretty good at thinking long term. We just need to bring that way of thinking over to the, over to the other, the, you know, the current account. Then the policies, so these are the rules of the game. Uh, what are we incentivising? What sort of policies and policy tools are encouraging what we need more of in our economy? And if we're really honest, working out how to power down the sort of ec economic activities that are not aligned with what people and planet need, but importantly, do so in a, in a just way. You talked about some tools there about, you know, changing the way you think. Got any examples? Yeah, so a lot of governments around the world are broadening out their suite of policies of what they look at. So things like multi-dimensional wellbeing frameworks, which is a bit of a, a clunky term, but over half of the OECD governments have these frameworks where they broaden out what they're defining as success, what the goals of government are beyond fairly narrow economic fundamentals that, that you were talking about earlier. That's a key starting point. You can't stop there. You know, those measures are important. They're important to have a broader suite uh, on your radar of what, who's winning and who's losing out of the current arrangements, particularly if you disaggregate properly. So you see what groups in society are, are struggling and which groups are perhaps um, doing better. And, and really so you can take good analysis of the current state of affairs. But that's not enough. You then need to utilise that state of play, that information, to design the policies in a way that they invest where investment's needed and that they take action. And so one really great example comes from the state of Victoria in Australia, and they have something called the Early Intervention Investment Framework, comes out of the Treasury, and they're saying they're looking at their budget at the moment, they're saying about 45% of what the Victorian budget is spent on is acute services, homelessness services, police and so on, and they're seeing it go up and up. And they're saying, crikey, this is not financially sustainable. We need to act to stop this downstream response because we're not going to be able to afford it. And so what they're saying is if they can identify groups in society or individuals in society who are at risk of becoming facing chaotic lives or needing those services, but can they intervene early in a positive way, say with housing support or mental health support, for, for example, other forms of, of uh, employment support, for example, then they can start to bank the savings. So it's quite innovative because they're then reinvesting the funds to do more of that upstream work. 
it's not quite upstream enough as where as I'd like to go. I would like to pe see people not at risk in the first place. But this is a sort of framing and the sort of approach and the sort of, to be honest, really innovative experimentation that I think we need more of. And that's mm. what the wellbeing economy agenda really opens up. Wing Effects Change is brought to you in partnership with Kiwi Bank to help you understand the issues affecting the economy. And that's what their team of experts is here to do too. Here's Kiwi Bank economist Sabrina Delgado on the current grim status of the global and local economy. Globally, economic output and activity is slowing. Higher interest rates are weighing heavily on demand and crushing activity. It's not pretty, but it's what's needed to bring down inflation. Here in Aotearoa, the outlook is soft at best. Our impressive surge in net migration helps lift activity, but still the economy is weakening under the weight of the Reserve Bank and a softening global backdrop. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to stay up to date with detailed economic analysis and forecasts from Sabrina and other KiwiBank experts. They take big issues from both here and overseas and make them relevant to Kiwi businesses. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and of course past performance does not guarantee future returns. How do you avoid, you know, the well-being word um, being captured and then used to distract, delay, deny real action? Because I, I just a, a quick heads up: I've been reading well-being budgets for four years, where Treasury and New Zealand's Treasury has been telling me, and the Finance Minister has been telling me, and everyone else that they now think about the world in well-being terms and they have a, a living standards framework which is being promoted and it has a great website and everyone says, yep, I'm thinking about the environment, I'm thinking about the externalities, I'm thinking about all these things and then the same decisions get made and when you actually look at the cabinet papers of the actual advice that's been given to the ministers and the, the way that decisions are framed, it's the same old well, we've got to run a budget surplus, we've got to keep government spending down. Uh, yes, we have to deal with this, um, these people who are at the bottom of the cliff, but we don't have time and we don't have money um, to invest in people who probably don't deserve it. And there's a whole bunch of median voters who won't let us invest in those people anyway. So we'll just talk a good game on wellbeing for a few years, hope that nobody notices and then um, uh, that's another four or five years wasted. Yeah, and there's a couple of elements in, in your question there. So, so one is that this is hard. And so if we take in good faith the, the intentions, we know that it's going to take some time to change the machinery of government and to roll this out across all government departments. And there'll, there'll be plenty of people within government. I often call them policy entrepreneurs or um, Sophie Howell, the Future Generations Commissioner from, from Wales, who's just left her post, has called them frustrated champions. There'll be plenty of people within the corridors of power who understand that business as usual is not good enough and they want to utilise their role within government to make changes. And so often they can really use that rhetoric and that language to push forward a bit more. But often they're the exception that proves the rule. And so I don't think we should kid ourselves that changing all the heuristics all the incentive systems, all the processes, all the personal evaluation and even promotion mechanisms that are ingrained within government is going to be easy. It's not a simple flick of the light switch. There have been um, useful tricks, I suppose, new heuristics that have been plugged into government. And in fact, New Zealand was one of the first to start, for example, using um, uh, corporate accounting methods and systems to judge performance of government. So you had a, a profit and loss type of sheet, you had a, a balance sheet with assets and liabilities and you measured performance on, well, that's a bit like a profit and loss. If you've got a, if you've got a surplus, that's a good thing. That's like a profit. <laughs> and, you know, if you're able to, you know, reduce your debt, you know, suddenly you've got higher net worth as a government. 
And so the framing of it was very much, let's use these tools of accountability to drive different types of behavior. Are there other tools that you could use or maybe converting the existing tools to change the framing so that instead of saying our main aim is to run budget surpluses and to reduce government debt, instead our main aim is to um, uh, reduce the future health liability or to increase the future productivity dividend of having a healthier uh, workforce. How do you, you know, change the heuristics? Uh, well, it's a really good example, actually, how we define what is an asset, <laughs> what is a cost, what's a benefit. So even just those terms are hugely loaded, aren't they? And, and so if people are not given permission to think more broadly when they're doing their cost benefit analysis, for example, when they're defining what's an asset. I mean, is an asset a bridge or is it a healthy environment? Is it a healthy ecosystem? Is it healthy rivers? Until people are able to start taking that that very much broader view. And so that comes back to the, you know, the point earlier around, it's about also about perspectives and, and mindsets. And they take a while to, to change. You know, this is sort of the culture change. So yes, you need the hard wiring of government. And and New Zealand actually, I'd say others have been, you know, taken a, a leaf out of New Zealand's book in that New Zealand did change the State Sector Act, it did change the Finance, Public Finance Act. So it started to change some of the hard wiring of government, but if you don't change people's mindsets and the culture, all those structures will just become stale and stagnant. So you need you need both tasks as, as well. You mentioned earlier the, the risk of wellbeing washing, and and I think that's that's also something really worth dwelling on because I, wellbeing's a broad term, isn't it? And and I, I get media alerts for when wellbeing's in the news and. Every, every you know, one in five is, say, the Hyatt has opened a new wellness spa and I you know, roll my eyes and delete it very quickly. But but it's quite seriously, there's, there's a broad church of how wellbeing is defined. I tend to think of it as almost two SCs. There's almost this duality, these two SCs. And so one is that comes from proponents who would say we can take a very narrow uh, view of wellbeing. It's all about individual subjective wellbeing. So burn it on a scale of one to ten, how happy do you feel? And, and that's part of it. But my, my concern is to, with too much of a narrow focus on that understanding of well-being, it often puts all the onus of change on the individual. Uh, it, it ignores adaptive preferences, but it very much says if we can just treat individuals through therapy or other forms of treatment, then we can leave the structures that are causing them harm or making them anxious or making them feel their lives are out of control because of their, you know, they're being used as just, just in time inventory in the gig economy, for example, we can use, leave them untouched. So it's almost a system preservation agenda where the proponents probably don't mean it that way, but that's how it plays out. So that brings us to the other SC, which is system change. And that's again where the wellbeing economy agenda is unashamedly situated. It's saying, yes, let's help people survive and cope today and tomorrow, that acute needs that we were, we were talking about earlier. But again, let's look at the circumstances in which people can live good lives. And, and so, for example, there's a lot of talk at the moment about child wellbeing. Mm. I often think if we're really serious about child wellbeing, we can't just look at children. We need to look at how are their families faring, what's the labour market like that their families are facing, what are the issues of inequality and injustices, what's the local environment like, do they feel safe working through their park, can they go out to play, are the streets polluted and so on. And so again, this is really doing that channeling the, the inner three-year-old, as I said earlier, and looking upstream and looking more broadly. So that is that is absolutely front and centre of what the wellbeing economy agenda is about. Just finally, you know, if you were um, suggesting to people ways and tools and things to plug into the system, if you like, to try to get things moving forward, what sort of ideas would you put forward um, in terms of reforming accounting, financial targets, you know, what, what sort of techniques could you plug into the system? Yeah, so there's four areas of action that I tend to think about. And to be honest, it's like a jigsaw puzzle of changes we're going to need to transform the economy. And fortunately, lots of people are working on different pieces of that jigsaw puzzle. So no single person needs to cover them all. And I'm certainly not an expert uh, in, in any of them, really. I like to see them all, all joined up. But I, how I cluster that jigsaw puzzle of changes is, you know, with a jigsaw puzzle, you start with the corners. So the four Ps of the corners of the wellbeing economy jigsaw puzzle in practice, purpose, 
prevention, pre-distribution and people powered. So purpose is around right things like changing the very purpose of government. Scotland's national performance framework would be an example of that, but crucially putting that into practice, aligning budget goals with attending to where people are failing, falling behind on some of those measures. For example, pro-social business models would be an, another example, all sorts of things in, in that corner. Next one is around prevention, and we've talked a bit about that, but another practical example, the more circular our production and consumption systems are, the fewer beach cleanups we'll need, uh, the more jobs deliver a sense of meaning and purpose and dignity and control, the less anti-anxiety treatments our doctors will be prescribing. And, and folks will be able to think of their own examples there. The next one is pre-distribution. And this is essentially saying, yes, we need government to redistribute after the fact through taxes and welfare. But we know all the political machinations and palavers involved in that conversation. And often it's quite a stigmatising conversation as well. We see a lot of horrible stigma about you know, welfare recipients. Pre-distribution is essentially saying, how can the economy do more of the heavy lifting? delivering more equal outcomes from the beginning. So things like worker cooperatives, where you have the, the workers owning the capital, things like community wealth building, where you're generating local economic multipliers through local jobs, procuring, procuring to local firms, just getting, while they're waiting for trickle down, generating economic activity from the community up. And there's lots of good examples around the world where that's really being taken seriously. Also things like true cost accounting. So we're not seeing falsely cheap uh, goods and services because we've conveniently ignored the environmental cost of, of an item. And then the final one, people power, essentially really making sure that people are at the forefront of decisions that affect them. And there are some really good examples from around the world, whether that's participatory budgeting or citizens' assemblies or, again, worker co-ops that are starting to democratise the workplace are really great examples. So different people in their different spheres of influence will gravitate to different pieces of that jigsaw puzzle, fortunately, because there's a lot of change needed. I think the key thing is to really think about what's the ultimate goal that we're all looking for and, and everyone will bring something different to that party. Catherine, thank you very much for being on Win the Facts Change. Such a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Ben. When the Facts Change was brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network, together with Kiwi Bank. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to find out how Kiwi Bank are making Kiwi better off. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.